Good evening, everyone. I'm sorry we um, was um, late tonight. It had some technology issues, but we are here. Praise the Lord, we are here. Um, amen, amen. I'm sorry for the lateness. We had some numbers. I apologize. Agree. Um, so what we're going to do, I'm like what, what he said, breathe for a moment. So we're just going to breathe for a moment and um, and jump on in um, to this discussion tonight. Um, I am thankful that my panelists was um, patient with me tonight. Amen. Um, give me one more minute. Now you're live, you know that, right? Yeah. All right. So tonight we are going into this thing called live. Amen, amen. So tonight we are going to just breathe for a moment. Again, we had some technology, but reconnecting my sexuality to my spirituality is in the room. So let's, before we get all started and get everything out of the way and let me put my wig back on and my lipstick and I lost it all on, but that's okay. We're going to go ahead and move forward in the name of Jesus. So first and foremost, welcome tonight to reconnecting my sexuality to my spirituality. And we welcome you. Last night, we had a ball with our trans siblings, but tonight we're going to pop it. So not delaying anything, but let's get some housekeeping out of the way. Remember, we meet first and third Sunday of each month at 11 a.m. If these things are blessing you, please cash up us at dollar favor buy. So that's the, that's the cleanup right there. So let me just say, let me set it up today. Um, I want to move from a living room to a kitchen table with some collard greens and some pig feet and some virgin stuff and all the other things and your drink of choice. So come on, let us sit at this table and let us have this discussion and go into deep on part two of reconnecting my sexuality. So come on. You know, go get your Kool-Aid, go get your adult drink, go get something. Reverend Jermaine, help him with some food for the table for your vegan yeah. self, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, we got vegan on here. Yeah, we got vegan on here. Yeah, we got help everything. Him, we he got a big feet. Yeah, everything on there. So we are going to go ahead and move forward. So real quickly, um, I'm going to give my panelists, my two brothers, a chance to induce themselves. We have one new individual. Um, the other two, I'm not sure if they're coming on, but we're moving forward. Anyway, go ahead and introduce yourself. So I'll start. So I am Reverend Jermaine DMR Green from UFC NYC, which is connected to UFC M. And I am just an excited person. Been ordained in the movement for a hot minute. Delves into the understanding that spirituality has allowed me to find freedom in the space of religion. So I have uh, served in many capacities in this amazing denomination, went to school, get some knowledge, pull all that together, and you have this now amazing fruit salad, which is called Reverend Jermaine DMR Green. So I'm ready for this conversation and, and excited to jump in and get in where I fit in. Amen, amen. Double Dutchery. <laughs> I'm, I'm Elder Reverend Kevin E. Taylor, Senior Pastor of Unity Fellowship Church, New York in Newark, oh. New Jersey. Uh, the, the, like been pastor for 22 years. It was the, uh, the, the, the nomination for 30 years this year. Uh, author, producer, director of LGBTQ services and development at an agency here in Newark, uh, NJCRI. Love these conversations. These are life. These are bread and butter. And that is, uh, uh, that is vegan butter which can be really good and tasty and high fresh rolls with no yeast. So let's go. Let's go, Pastor. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. All right. Let's go. Let us go. Amen. 
So we're going to go ahead and jump on into this question. Um, and I am excited for tonight. I'm really excited for what we are getting into. So um, the first question I want to get into tonight is, is the issue of one connecting to their own sexuality is because they do, I mean, excuse me, let me read that one more time. And is the issue of connecting to one spirituality is because one does not know what spirituality is? Is it an issue for one to connect to their spirituality because they don't know what it is? I think that, you know, because even in the wording, it's like connect, reconnecting your sexuality to your spirituality. The idea that they are separated is the conflict in the first place, right? We know who we are. We just are listening to voices that are trying to redefine that, that is trying to suggest that that is something else, you know, that um, kid, you know, I don't know if you've ever been in a space, but many of us, you know, especially the three of us who've been in spaces you know, where we've talked about spirit and spirituality and these things since we were young, we've been in a room where a child was speaking to nothing, right? Would be that, you know, the whole idea of imaginary friend in all of the ways that we have found things and, 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 and grace and space where we have felt alone is spirituality. The, 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 the conflict we have is often we're trying to jam spiritual, uh, we're trying to jam religion down spirituality through. So it must be this because I had that. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, when I was a kid, I remember somebody asking me who my favorite singer was. And I said, Natalie Cole. And they said, well, I don't like her. I said, you didn't ask me who your favorite singer was. You asked me who mine was. It's the same thing. It's like we got we to gotta stand in, a, you know, an authority on who we are, whose we are, where we are, and how we got there so that we're moving at our own pace in our own space by our own grace, you know, in our own understanding of it versus this thing where people spend so much time judging other people's faith, other people's walk, other people's dialogue. And I'm like, how you how you so blessed assurance Jesus of mine with your stuff on earth that you got time to come over here? Because you got a partner, if you got kids, if you got coworkers, you done cuss four times a day. So clean that up. Do the lean stuff you need to do to clean yourself up and worry about your own salvation, as grandma and them used to say. And, and and stop trying to act like God is going to ask you about other people when you get to heaven. When you get to that space, when you transcend out of this skin, so let's get beyond the parenthetical of walking through the gates. When you have to sit with, 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 with it, with them and yourself, I don't think anybody else is coming up. Okay, so so I was I was in the line of children don't have to learn to walk. They already know how. It's the fact of finding their balance in the process of reaching for something. So do I think uh, humans, my human siblings across the planet, don't know what spirituality is? Uh, because they've always been able to connect to, as Elder said, in reference to their imaginary friends, and they're having a full out conversations, or grandma or nana done made transition. But yet the child is somehow speaking to Nana in the room while they sleeping. It's the fact that it's always been there. We cannot be disconnected from something that has always been there. It was there when we were fashioned. It was there when we came into this world. It was there when we took our first breath. So it's impossible to disconnect something. And the only way it disconnects is when we listen to other people that say, it got to look this way. And now, now that we're trying to figure out, oh, it got to look like how he said, or she said, or they said, or them said, then I'm not that anymore. No, no, no. You've always been that. You get to rest in that blessed assurance that it was yours. You get to get a whole foretaste of glory divine. Why? Because it was always there. It's like reconnecting to the inner child within you that allows you to then experience the fullness of what spirituality yeah. is. Yeah. Without listening to the noise without listening to the static, without being distracted by, it looks like they more spiritual than me. Uh -uh. <laughs> your journey is your journey and you nurturing and get that, that allows you to find it for you. Your path is your path. Ain't nobody else walking that path. Swag it up, do what you need to do. Find the, the divine of your understanding. 
and trust it will lead you in ways that you've never been lost about. So sexuality can't be lost, can't be disconnected, can't be refrained, can't be repressed. It's always been there. Made perfectly and walk perfectly because it was all love that made you. So you can't be disconnected from any of those things. So I think it's just, I understand how some people can feel disconnected because they don't get the tingle feelings anymore. Spirituality ain't always a tingle, sugar. <laughs> Spirituality, it can't be boxed in to be this, oh, I, I think I was supposed to do this. When I went to the water, I was supposed to feel this. When I looked at this, I was supposed to feel that. When I read that book, it was supposed to make me this. No, 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 no. You, we can't box it in. Religion, as past elder said, is forcing down spirituality's throat because it's bo trying to box it in and limit it to only be. Now, this is what we allow here. You can worship, you can throw your hands up, you can run through the church. We allow that. But seeing through a veil, talking to mama and nana. I, we, no, no, we don't want that here. You can praise, cut a mean step, get some fancy footwork in, get a good cry in. But don't talk about that you done sat there and had a connection and was like, oh, you know, your mother wanted you to know that it was okay. Somehow that spirituality aspect is not allowed because it's something out there. But you're, it was always there. We can't be disconnected from who we were always from the moment that the, the sperm hit the A, spirituality was already beginning to be formated in us and through us. So yeah, that's that's my uh, answer to that question. Okay. Well, we have the great, wonderful, beautiful, powerful, someone who's becoming a friend and brother, the great apostle Montgomery in the house. So we're going to let you do a little combination of both. We are talking about is the issue is because um, people cannot connect to spirituality because they do not know what spirituality is. And then we'll move to the part two of this. Amazing. Well, good evening to the panelists. I'm sorry I'm running a few minutes late. And good evening, everyone. It's so good to be here. And thank you, uh, Reverend Heron Arrington, for having me. Um, now, ask that question again to me so I make sure that I respond appropriately. Okay. What I was asking is, is, is the issue why one cannot connect to spirituality is because one does not know what spirituality is? I, I think we, I, I, I don't know how others answer, so forgive me if I'm repeating someone or echoing someone's response. However, I would say that my personal opinion uh, on, on this question would be simply that I think that in many ways, we have tried to create our own avenue of connection with our, with the most high without, um, with the inclusion of abandoning, abandoning the uh, disdain or the hurt or the disappointment that we've experienced. And so religion has become spirituality for many people. Uh, but I think the depth of the, the, the solid answer to this would be that no, I, I don't think we fully understand what spirituality is and how it drives one's religion. But spirituality should be the foundational base of the relationship with the Most High. And let me also say this before I get into um, part, um, the next part of this, and you kind of already hit on it, but I, I'm going to dive into a little bit more. Be after we did the part um, one of this discussion um, in June, what there was a input, not from one to three people who saying, they really didn't understand what spirituality is and why do we not preach spirituality? So this is where one, this is where one of the questions came from tonight because people has asked this question. So the second thing to this is so that we can maybe help these individuals who hopefully tonight is listening or will listen at another time. Is religion and spirituality different? Is it different? 
and I want to answer so bad, but I'm closing my mouth. I'm going to let y'all panelists go for it. Go for it. <laughs> NG, go ahead. Well, I, 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 no, no, I always I, go first, so go, Montgomery, go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, you know, I believe that it is a difference. Uh, spirituality is a, a relationship with the Most High versus religion is a practice. It's a it's a tradition that one does or what some would call a ritual. And so you most more than likely find your rituals in, under the religious practice of your spirituality. I think, you know, um, for me, that would be the difference to, 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 to be a short answer. Okay, so I'm gonna word. give you last word, babe, bro. I want you to have last word on this one. I, Cause mine might be as short as yours. I think that, uh, I think that they are different and that spirituality is the, is the connection that you just said, Apostle, and that religion is the frequency with which you practice it, right? So you can go and sit by the, sit by the lake and find quiet time and meditation and not talk to God while you're there. And after an hour or two of clean, clean, cleansing your brain of all the weeks worth of stuff that you've had in it. Go, okay, God, now that that's gone, now let's talk, right? So the three hours of meditation prior to that was your spirituality, centering itself, purging, cleansing, clearing out, clearing up, cleaning up, so that you can talk to God about what you need, what you're going through, so you can talk and exchange and engage this way versus, first of all, let me talk about my co-working, then these kids that's getting and we, and all the toxicity that we spend so much time on that ends up making right. religion seem so bad. It's only because we, you know, we need to file mass malpractice suits against some of our own practices and get mm -hmm. to what we came for, right? Just get to Lord help. Oh, for the malpractice suits. So are they different? Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, religion is the book that gives out some basic directions, whatever your, your path is. Spirituality allows you to go beyond the book to have a relationship that's based on God meeting you, the divine meeting you right where you are. The book says it can only happen in very linear ways. But when you go beyond that, the relationship goes in everything and every possible way. The good conversation with grandma and grandma begins to talk about yesteryear and it begins to bring about something within you that allows you to connect to grandma in a true way. That spirit began to link you and connect you in amazing ways for you to experience God greater than what the book says. Because the book may not speak to you losing your job. The book may not speak to you having amazing conversation with a Muslim and they give you an insight to their path. Wow. The book is not going to give you the mindset and the capacity and the desire to connect to someone that has a different path than you to find wow. reverence in it to see God present in that. So are they different? Absolutely. But then we also have what I always have said, they are religious spirituality. That's when we find within there the mystic side of our path. But then that's still connected to the path. Spirituality will be the bridge that connects you to anything and everything and allow you to see God in it and experience God in it and through it. So that's my answer in short and long form. And, you know, if we could, y'all, while, while, you know, while we're having this expanded conversation, I would also like to make to, to make it a point to expand the conversation about the word, because sometimes people only go looking for what they've been told, you know. I know it's like to sit in a room with, in, a, in a Bible study with a room full of women at one of our uh, uh, media meetings and read, you know, the woman ate from the apple comma, and gave some to the man who was with her, and watched women's hearts break, because they had never heard that Adam was standing right beside Eve, because she was supposed to be the wandering woman who didn't know her place and ran off, and I was like, it's right here, but they'd never mm -hmm. heard that, right? And when you talk about even all of these relationships and the ways that we engage God, they make it seem like you can only go to the God, you know, you can only go to the throne a certain way, but Jesus went in the garden at Gethsemane. Jacob wrestled with, you know what I mean? It's like, it's even in the word, which just said, you know, in the love songs and sonnets in, in Psalms and, and Solomon and Proverbs. But, you know, then it makes it too colloquial. It feels too touchable, too reachable. And then it becomes too teachable. There you are. There you go. 
Um, and, and those are what's wonderful um, thing is, but you know what I have been challenged as a preacher and a teacher after getting some of the response from part one, I had to sit and ask myself, am I preaching and teaching more on spirituality? Um, or is, as Green says, is I'm really sticking with that book? And I think sometimes we have to ask ourselves, are we teaching people from our pulpit or, you know, we are virtual. So in my, my study, are we really teaching people about spirituality or self-consciously we are still repeating and teaching them religion? So that's another question is, are we really diving in and helping and holding someone's hands and saying, I, I know that religion is a little cloud and then spirituality. So that's where I'm going tonight. So I, I don't know who wants to jump through the screen or uh, run across the, the floor, but I'm going to open it up and let you see what you're going to do with that. Okay. Well, well, I'm just, go ahead. Go ahead, Reverend Jimmy, because I went first last time. Come on, go, brother. So, okay, so I love that question. So I realize religion will keep you under control. They used, they said that in the book of Eli, that the, the purpose, they, in this uh, apocalyptic space, religion was the thing that allowed them to control folks. Spirituality will give you freedom, and you can't control folks when they begin to seek God for their own understanding. And they're praying for God their own self. They're finding a way that I can talk to God, like the song says, I can go to God in prayer. It didn't say I went to pastor to go call and pray for me. It says, I go to God in prayer. So it becomes that thing where we can't control what that looks like and their relationship looks like. That becomes an abusive relationship when we only want to teach people from a place that we can control their growth. Spirituality, there is no limits. There's no glass ceiling. The ceiling was already broken. The moment we sat there and they said, and it's a boy. And they said, and it's a girl. And it is a thing. And it is a thing. The moment that birth happened, there was no ceiling in spirituality that we can be controlled by. But when we listen to the distractions and the noise and, and the static, we then be like, oh, it can only be this way. Pastor has to see my spiritual growth in this way. Reverend must see it in this way. Deacon says, I can only really spiritually grow when I can utter in tongues. Mm. But not the fact that I prayed and then stuff began to manifest and I was able to reach into what was invisible and make it visible. No, that's not spiritual. This is the only way we need you to, it's called control. The abusive relationship when we only want to preach and teach folks how to find God from just this one source. But if God is everything and in all things, yeah. then that, that means I should be able to ask, Elder does all the time. I should be able to go to Anita Baker song and then find the spirituality and God speaking to me in it, through it, and bringing me out. But if I only know God from those men who wrote the text and try to give almost a drag type of perversion to women's stories, then yeah, I, I, can, I, can, I can be controlled. I can be managed. But God is not containable. God is limitless. So yeah, that's my response to that. Uh, All right. You you want to go next, Elder? I do because I want you to have the last word. Yeah, I feel like I always do. <laughs> Let me. So here, and I made a vow, and I tell you now, I'm giving you the best that I got. Hello, you want to go to the book of Anita Baker? So the beauty of it is, is that I thank God for having lived a life and walked the streets where it is moving in the both andness of it, because I know a lot of people who have moved away from religion into this thing they call spirituality and drowned in the sea of abyss because they didn't grab hold to anything. They were like, I'm not aligned to anything. Then when they get in trouble, they literally don't know what to do because they haven't been in any sense of practice. They don't know how to center in meditation. They don't know how to be still in grace. They don't know how to pray. And so it's like, I think that where we as teachers and leaders can use this thing, this Bible thing especially, is to give people an anchor to go back to, to be able to say, there's got to be something in here to help me. And you know, the, 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 the beauty of it for us is that we get to take a conversation like you just had, uh, 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 Reverend Green, and crack it open for people. It's like, oh, you had an egg, but I don't know how to cook. <laughs> and then a well-tailored chef comes in with, you know, 
with some salt, some pepper, some paprika, add some stuff to it, and now you've got an omelet. It's like, how did you make this out of what I had? Because mm -hmm. if you don't want to do the work, you will say you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free, leaving yeah. all of the responsibility yeah. on this something that comes along and changes you. Versus you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. There you go, you're free. What you do with it is on you. You're free. There you go. Some people get free and still don't go to well. That's why they want to be set free. Like when God is ready for me to, when God, when God, when God says, God said, I told you to go three weeks ago. I told three you no ago. when you were leaving the date. Nope, that ain't him. Yeah, but I'm lonely. And I, I mean, he could. I, like, you said you asked me. I said no. Do what yeah. you want. That's what we don't like free will. That's why people keep going in other directions in religion. Because Christian never has free will right at the top. Do what you want. You can do anything you want. People are like, yeah, but I'm waiting on God. God said, no, no, no. I'm waiting on you. There you go. You keep waiting up and standing in the exact same spot and I say move. Exactly. You know, I'll add, I'll add my two cents to this in response this way. In order to teach spirituality, the teacher must be comfortable with extraordinary behavior. And I choose to say it this way because for, for so long, church looked like or mirrored what it always was, except we were allowed to wear jeans and now women could wear makeup. And then the inclusive movement came along and it's the same scene, Come on, more, sir. more than likely the same behavior, except all can come right. and worship and not be preached about from the pulpit. The reality is in order for us to truly be the church, in order for us to truly teach on spirituality, we must be willing to empower people to explore their inner self because relationship or spirituality is a result of intimacy. And I really want to wait on this topic because I, I love talking about this. You can't be intimate with man or your spouse unless you have an intimacy with the most high. The one who created you and designed you, if you don't know how to be intimate with him, then how are you gonna be intimate with someone else? And, and so how are we able to get deeper into our spiritual depth is the ability to explore who God really is and who he designed you to be and the freedom to be who you are without succumbing to the pressures of external drivers. So part of why that is so delicious and so I think we can go keep expanding this if I could, uh, uh, Pastor Arrington. What part of why this is so delicious that you just said, Apostle, is rooted in what Reverend Jermaine said. And, and let, let's just make some sort of remarkable dish here because the truth is, as we keep cracking this open, uh, we have we find ourselves taking that as our as our as our as our bedrock, as our tool, as our starting point, whatever that is, and then just peeling it onion wise, right? Yeah, you are. As you talk, I, I, I preached at. Um, uh, Rivers of Living Water in New York several years ago, and the uh, thing was intimacy, right? And I was the opening preacher, and I, you know, spent all this time, as you just said, going into the Word. We know how God loves us. For God so loved the Word, He gave His own. And we've got several scriptures that speak to God's magnanimous love for us, right? What I realized is that very few scriptures, if any that I could find, said it back in a way that felt full and involved and expansive, mm -hmm. like somebody who had experienced God. And so what I ended up preaching that Sunday was, Lord, I made you a mixtape. And all of my scriptural reference were songs, were love songs, because these were the things that said what I really wanted to say to God, like, this will be an everlasting love. This will be the one I've waited for. This will be the first time anyone has loved me. I'm so glad you found me in time. I'm so glad you rectified my mind. That was written mm -hmm. by a preacher. The Reverend Marvin Yancey wrote that for Natalie Cole. And so we went there. We went to Willie, uh, Willie Nelson. And, uh, you are always on my mind. Little things I should have said and done. I didn't take the time. But you are always on my mind. You're, Lord, you're always on my mind. And just kept unpacking it. And, you know, to watch people in a, in a space 
you know, go like, wait a minute, this is making too much sense because I know these songs. And then, you know, at the time being contemporary, you know, my praise song was you earned it the weekend, you know? It's like, you, I, I'm praising and giving you glory because you deserve it and you earned mm -hmm. it. And I've never been in a space where, like, I promise you, there were 300 people, 290 of them shouted. Just people passing out because I was like, it felt like the freedom of, oh my God, somebody finally put in shape what I want to say to the Lord, but I could never find the words. And as you said, Reverend Jermaine, they always existed. They just weren't in church. Karen and them said Jesus is a love song. Okay. Right? They said it. They almost got kicked out because of it. But that was why. I was like, that feels too much. That feels too much like. Like what? Men talk, you know, but then, you know, thankfully we've lived long enough for, you know, for Jonathan Butler to say falling in love with Jesus is the best thing I've ever done. And so we start to see that show up in church now. People are going, oh, these young people, these young people have just done what the juke joint people brought to church on Sunday. It just keeps them all. So I just want to add another and, piece and of I, uh, 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 the comfortability or what I would coin clergy self-esteem. You got to be confident and comfortable in spirituality and sexuality in order to free people and pour into folks from the pulpit. If your clergy self-esteem said, because <laughs> you know when kids, you say something sexual, <laughs> it's that, that uncomfortable laugh. If you are, as a cleric, having that uncomfortable laugh when sexuality and spirituality come up, then your self-esteem ain't yet there. So you need to have an intimate relationship with self. Yes. With God, with spirit, and then come out and start having that conversation. And that is not always a comfortable thing because then that means you got to say that you, you're not ready. But I'm I'm pastor so-and-so. I'm right. elder so-and-so. I'm such and such and such. I'm supposed to be. No, that's not true. We all get to have a born again experience and come back to our process and 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 find God anew, because life happens. We're clergy yeah, yeah. are not removed from life happening. We're in it and have to kind of navigate through it in our own ways, and that's when our spirituality and our anchoring and our base in whatever religion, because the power is we get to create syncretism and find a new way to experience God that then allows us to speak it. But if yes, I'm uncomfortable having the conversation about this uncontrollable, the thing I can't control because I think, just like in the book of Eli, I was supposed to control you through religion. Women, you got a place, sit there. Stay silent, girl. Uh, you, you don't, mm, mm, this, is, this is a man's world. <laughs> but uh, Beyonce came, the good prophet, and told us who runs the world. Girls. So it becomes this process. If you ain't got the clergy self-esteem to kind of have those conversations, it's going to make you feel uncomfortable. <laughs> it's going to make you have that, that uncomfortable laugh. That's, right. That's why sexuality ain't really spoken because we can't even get into the Songs of Solomon to talk about the intimacy there and the is. Of stuff that is biblically based. It, it's hard for me. It, it's hard for me. It's hard for me to sit there and really do spirituality from the place that spirituality allows you to float on, step on water and walk. Because now you are anchored in something greater than yourself and it's driving you to do. <laughs> can't, can't, can't do that because I, I'm not comfortable discussing that. <laughs> I haven't even delved into that level of intimacy with the divine within my own personal life because exactly. I, I was supposed to already have it. No, sugar, we get to relive it. We get to go back. We get to refine it. We get to have a born again experience and have the intimacy deepen over time. We don't get to have our two year old intimacy at 14, at 25, at 35, at 45. And if we do, it's okay. You now have the invitation to listen to this whole conversation and take the jewels to then go back and have your born again experience with your spirituality and your comfortability around sexuality. My goodness. Well, you know, the thing is, and I want to say this before we move on, where my liberation is, and because I, I don't have any issues with um talking about sexuality and spirituality and all those things. But when I went under the lens of liberation and looked at the woman at the well, what that really was a conversation, because when Jesus asked her, about um, um about Jacob and she said you know this is Jacob's well and everything and Jesus had to unpack that 
and give her a, a understanding that you are talking about religion. I am giving you um, um, spirituality. And Jesus would basically say, this is not Jacob. You know, use the language. And I, you know, and I love my elder telling and I'm, I'm getting bold enough to start using some of those songs that he used. And so, you know, I, I just couldn't imagine after she got that liberation and understanding, it was not about Jacob. It was not about religion. Spirituality was here. She began to sing that song by Sylvester and Patty LaBelle. You know, I've been looking around and my friend has been here all the time. You know what I'm saying? And that is the powerful thing that I see in there. And I think sometimes we have to go under the lens of spirituality to pull it out to people is. So it's getting ready to get hot in here. So for the next questions, I hope none of y'all jump off right now. So the, um, the question I have is, oh, is, no. is with the black church, um, why is not, the black church talking about sex and sexuality. The church ain't talking about sex and sex. We gonna put that on black people. The church ain't no Sunday, church Sunday is the holiest day. People don't even have sex on Sunday. They just become they become martyred version of themselves. The church we don't know we we have we literally have the great divide of the human condition is the transition from Saturday night to Sunday morning. Okay, right? so it's either, it's either people very either or they. They want to be, you know, rabble rousers and ratchet on Saturday night and be sanctified and holy on Sunday morning as though there is no bridge there. And so <laughs> black people, quite frankly, not only not uh, don't talk about it, we don't talk, we, we, we are the we are the purveyors of that line because we we were getting it in on Saturday. The, 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 tr the struggle of the church, let me go ahead 100, is that some of them recognize the musicians on the keyboard from the juke joint the night before. Some of them recognize the tune, the rhythm, the beat of the song on Sunday morning. They're like, oh my God, that's what that's. I knew that song sounded familiar to me last night. Now they don't know if, if oh Danny boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling or amazing grace shall always be my song of praise. They don't know which one came first because we, we live in that thing and then make it a conundrum. And Lord knows, you know, black people as much as we have struggled with this outwardly letting other people try to, 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 to throw us in this, this uh, 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 abyss of patriarchy. Black people have been, the, have been the ones who had the queen directing the choir and playing the piano and singing their face off. Black people have been the ones who have had the most ferocious and expressive you know, praise and religiosity of it because we wanted to lay our burdens down. And so it's only when the black church sat down and had dinner with evangelicals that we found any problems inside the black church. Before that, we was fine. Before that, we, you know, that's that, who that boy can say. So she, one of them sisters, like, who that sister? No, he can say. They would have just said that. They just knew it. Holiday Heart was that, you know? And we got to be clear about that so that we stop demonizing our old people and forgetting that just that something got introduced into the conversation that demonized the dialogue. Because before that, Sylvester stood on the apple box and said, you never grow old at 10 years old. As the same little queen that he grew up to be in the disco. He said that somebody starts to look at it through somebody else's lens. Somebody said that earlier. We talk about the lens. When we look at our, when we look at our own culture through our own acculturated lens, anointing is anointing, gifts are gifts. That's why half the divas in gospel got a queen behind them, making, look, making her look like the queen she is. So, oh, they can talk all the foolishness they want. They will never release. They will never release gay men from the church because Queen Esther only became queen because of seven gay men bringing her together. And all of those first ladies are using that same spirituality and that same scripture. That same scripture. The part of you that is female, that understands how I desire to see myself, how I want to move in the world, how I want to align myself, and the part of you that is masculine that can see me. Am I sex? You tell me before I ask my husband. I'm gonna ask you. Oh, I'm gay. I can't see you. Yes, you can. You a man. I'm a pretty girl. You're stunning. Gay men get real complimentary women when they dust it for the gods. They, I, because they, we're not looking at them through the lens of sex or sexuality. Is can I see your divine beauty, girl? Yes, I can. Yeah. If he don't get this, he don't deserve it. So, 
the black church, you know, often gets demonized about being more homophobic, more this, more that. We're louder. We're more ferocious, voracious people. We do everything with excellence. Yes, we do. When I saw a couple at the club, we hit the dang floor. That's what we do. <laughs> you know, here's the thing. Can the church talk about sex? Yes. What are the barriers? One of the barriers that I believe the church has around sex is the idea that sex is more than for the purpose of reproducing. Now, it's clearly in the biblications that sex was more than just reproduction. I mean, they had concubines. Uh, and clearly, there is no depiction or no evidence in the word of God that would say that sex outside of producing a child was a sin unless one was coveting their neighbor's spouse. Those were the only times we've seen Christ had issue with um, sexual activity. Two, we are afraid of the thing that we enjoy the most. And I'll just say, because I'm black, gay, straight, bi, whatever you want to be, sex is always the premise of it. It is a scientific fact that preachers have a high sex drive. It's a scientific fact that when they come out the pulpit, their hormones is on 10. And I don't care who you are. I don't care what's going on in your life, male or female. It is a part of what is. It's a part of the scientific makeup. And technically, it is a reflection of the intimacy of Christ. Why would one have a desire or a drive for sexual intercourse after coming out of a deep word or, or being used by Christ. It is because Christ was so much in oneness with you that it awakened every part of you. It is not a demonic um, drive. It is not a, de a demonic attraction or desire. We have made it demonic because we don't care to dig deep into it. We just want to demonize and control the narrative of sex and the church. And for that purpose, you know, many church folk, I mean, I'm, I, I'm just going to say it because, you, know, you know, I had sex before marriage and I'm married now. And I'll just be honest with you. Having sex with church folk was interesting. I, I'd rather be with the, the world because they, they too much of that religion in the bedroom. You know, they 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 got all this. Oh, I can't do it. I can't. And listen, when when you are in one or experiencing intimacy with Christ, you can't limit what He wants to do with you. And I think in many aspects, we try to limit too much of what God is trying to do in our life, be it in an intimate setting or be it where he's trying to send us. We spend so much time burning the brakes in our lives, and then we're mad at God because, God, you ain't blessed me yet. You haven't given me a house yet. You haven't given me that spouse yet. You ain't given me what I wanted yet. But when God speaks to us to make a move, the first thing we do is question ourselves or look at ourselves and say, I'm incapable. How are you incapable of something that your heart is pulling you toward? That the word of the Lord says everything you need is inside of a man. I don't need someone to come to tell me I can do it. If God placed it in me, he's already given me the resources to execute the assignment. It is until we fall in love with uh, the intimacy of Christ, of doing what God says without having man's approval, that we're able and freely able to have conversations that would then change the trajectory of the whole religious sector. I think that's a big part of why we don't see miracles as much as we should. And we sit with high blood pressure. And, and ah. I mean, you know, the church is plagued with disease. And, and why is that? 
there's a problem with our depth of intimacy with Christ. And so herein lies the problem with sex, the conversation about sex. I'm uncomfortable with it, but you enjoying it. And doing it three and four times through the day. But it's, anyway, hallelujah. <laughs> Run on with it now. It's oh my God. So, 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 so I, I concur with my colleagues in, in, in this conversation. So I think when the anointing is used distortedly, it will continue to perpetuate until someone breaks the cycle. So mm -hmm. there was an uncomfortability that was transferred to, to, to people of color. And because we are the, the folks that will take something that is a lemon rind and turn it to lemonade, we took this distorted thing and we just took it to higher height. But the catch is, is when the cycle breaks. Right. Because it happens in all churches. All churches have some way of dealing with their uncomfortability with sexuality. They, mm -hmm. They'll gossip. The woman that gets, oh, you know she slept with something. Child, she was sleeping with the pastor who you think is so holy in the town and got a whole heart. <laughs> so, 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 so how is it that we can't see that? But then if we, if we look at it, nudity was then seen, which is a form of intimacy that you get to, to, to take in the fullness of a form. And it was said, no, we got to clothe it. We got to cover it up. But when Eve came over to Adam, she was free. She was free walking in the fullness of the anointing of I am fully God right now in this moment. And then when clarity or the chance of liberation came, it, I closed yourself, woman. Get a fig, get a leaf and cover yourself. And then the comment was, who told you you were naked? There was freedom in the intimacy of Jesus. But we, we're not ready for that. So as long as we continue not to allow people and have those conversations, uncomfortable conversations, uncomfortable conversations, stop calling people a Harley. Let's have the real conversation of what that's about. Let's stop demonizing the folk that folks have come into the fullness of who they are and they express it the way they do. Because it's truly the moment you have another form of worship. When two entities come together and go into something as deep as it is, it not only can heal you, it can free you. You can become emotional. You can yeah. cry. You can utter in a different way tongue that was not necessary what is that is a form of worship but we are not comfortable experiencing worship outside of the book and let's be 100 though because what you just said so eloquently goes back to the first book right so adam and eve walk around you know naked and screw up and then come back to god and it is god who says who told you you were naked right so where did this come from because it's not from me and nobody wants to say that it's not from me I didn't tell you you were naked. Who told what unpacked in you that made you not love who you are? And all of the ways that that shows up in the word, you know, you talk about the judginess, but Jesus said, you know, y'all trying to kill this woman who just slept with somebody. She slept with somebody. So who was that? The, the ones amongst you without sin throw the first stone. The reason nobody took the stone is because they'd have to throw it at themselves. There you are. Rahat, you know, the, the, the harlot, you know, the, the the sex worker because sex worker is sex worker is work was the one who said no no here's how y'all gonna be free I'm gonna put the red string on my, on my window that's how you know where to come in order to be just make sure you cover my family and they didn't go no girl I can't be seen with you they said this is what we owe you because all of the stuff you got on us because she ain't playing pious they are she's not playing holier than thou she doing she doing exactly what she do she's like ow Ow. Don't call it, don't, the Megan the Stallion, you can't, you, you looking at a bus preacher? You the preacher? Yeah, there was a moment at Aretha Franklin's funeral, uh-huh, where young, uh, uh, Ariana Grande came out, one of her tiny little skirts, because she's a tiny little girl, so she played, and one of the preachers was looking at her like she was on spare rear. Right? And it's like, she got on short skirt. You got you like you might be a leg man. Somebody else is a Megan is the style of booty man, so he can't even see. He's like, that's a little girl. I don't see nothing. You a leg man going. People busted you. You go stand in the pulpit and say, Oh, the Lord is working on me and praise the Lord. Or you can say I'm a leg man and y'all know it. Baby, stand up. I know you know, and tell me first lady, y'all said y'all been the one saying the first lady got she wear her slits a little high. The fact she had a slit at all, you don't want. You want her to be safe, safe.
to find it cover. And the truth is, you know, a lot of times when those mothers were covering those young girls' legs in the church, they weren't talking about them. They were talking about the man in the pulpit. Baby, I ain't coming mm -hmm. you for you. I'm coming you because of him. I don't trust them. I, he's anointed, but I don't trust his eyes. Okay. And when we can unpack all of that stuff, we, you know, again, where would we be if Adam and Eve had not, if Moses had, if people had just gotten, gotten past the stuff and just said, I always, we, we talked in Bible study about what, what would it have looked like if Moses, after he cursed out the people and God said, feed him, and he feed it, he fed him and gave him some shade. But for this reason, you and I get into the promised land. We just said, Lord, I'm sorry. Grace is not even, grace precedes, grace is absent from the word before Jesus. Like you made a mistake, you're dead, you're done, you're dead, you're done. And Jesus come along and said, the one with, without sin, John catch the first stone, no sin? All right. So nobody dies. He didn't say everybody get hit with a rock. He said nobody mm -hmm. gets hit by a rock because he put their souls down. And if we could get to that, then people could get on with the thing they're here to do, but, you know, instead of waiting to die to get to heaven to fulfill. That's right. And, you know, that is so very true because I, I believe that that's the reason that Peter had that visitation with the unclean animals. And, you know, when it was said that nothing, who told you that was not clean? Anything God make is clean. And I believe one of the issues is we, I can only speak for not anyone else. I know to remove my family, my mother, out of a room. If you sit her down and say, Mama, I'm going to talk about sex, I, that woman will move because we was taught you do not talk about it. You just do it. And I believe that's the issue is that we don't have what y'all was basically saying is we don't have the issue because we don't even know what empathy is. You know what I'm saying? And people get that confused with sex. You know what I'm saying? And that 15 to 20 of if you bless 40 minutes um that's not most people don't understand that is not empathy you know what i'm saying and they put it that way so where i want to go next year is, 40 minutes it depends on what you're doing watch yourself yes yeah now hold on an hour i could talk to you for hours let me talk to you so listen see hey you know what I'm saying? Because the, 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 you talk about intimacy, you know, Apostle brought this up, and if we're going to go there, we really do, because this woman sings this song that everybody was doing their version of, because she said, yours, mine, ours. You know, that she's talking about, you know, what are your needs, what are mine, what, what, what are your desires, what are mine, and then she says, I could talk to you for hours, but it was also one of the you know, probably of last year, it was the greatest love song because that the, the word says to pray unceasingly. So if you ain't talking to the Lord for hours and hours, you know, I'm gonna say a quick prayer. I don't know a quick prayer. The only quick prayer I know is help. That's it. Help. Otherwise, I'm talking to you for hours and hours while I'm typing that work up and like, Lord, thank you for the peace that surpasses all understanding. Please keep it going. Don't let Dolores come in here with 1130 food. Oh, it's 1145. It's the last day coming in. You're so good. Lord, I've decided if I could get some fish for lunch. Hey, girl, we're going over to the fish market. You want some? God, it's so good. You know what I mean? It's just like, it's always, and, 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 and we have to be that same way. It's like, what it, I find some of my best prayers in the shower because I'm butt naked. I'm tired. I want to rise. I, I want to I rise holy when I rise, right? It's like, good morning, God. How you doing? I'm feeling good. Right, right. You know, it's just this exchange where I don't have any hiding place. And so I feel like by the time I start getting dressed, God, God is a very present help in time of trouble. God, God, you know, you need to put some short sleeves on, baby. Come on, it's hot out today. Can't wear shorts or wear these long, no linen plans. They flow. What's going on, son? And then it just feels like, you know, and he walks with me, he talks with me, he tells me I'm his own. And to be in that kind of relationship, yeah. like you said, Elder, I mean, Apostle, when we talk about the spirit and, and, that, and that intimacy after you've been anointed and laid out, I don't want nobody to touch me. Don't touch me. There are people in my church who know that I got two or three people touch me. Everybody else, back up. That's it. Back up. I don't need you on me. I don't, I'm too exposed. And now, and I have I've had this thing over the last several years where I've had to say to my congr to, to my to my my circle clergy, like, don't move me until I say I, that I've got my legs. If I don't say I've got my legs, I ain't got my legs. And so we try to get halfway across the church and bam. I said I wasn't I wasn't finished talking to you. So how you doing? 
I'm a very deep Barry White sway of it all. It's like, oh, you oh, you still talk. Bring so and so and so into me. I'm sorry, Lord, I was moving too fast. That that thing that, like you said, we, that nobody taught us about because so much of our sex and sexuality is rooted in pain, is rooted in rape, is rooted in molestation. Yes. And so our journey of coming out is so much more than our sexuality. It's the fact that we dare bloom, we dare blossom, we dare be that free. That's why you see so many of these grandparents on or, and parents on social media with their kids because their kids are freer than they ever were. Can I have some of that? That little mm. dance you're doing, that's cute. Let me show you a couple of things we used to do. And you're like, Ma, the kids are going to love. Don't do that, but they love it. <laughs> Parents showing their daughter, my mother showing their daughter, you think you can do that making a stallion dad? You ain't got no, you ain't got no stallion yet. You a pony. Let me show your mama's making the stallion. The mama dropping, you're like, and they're like, mama. And one of, one or two parents will say, What? This how you got here. Mm-hmm. That's it. But the thing that I love and green, I love the analogy of going back to um the garden of eden and however we believe the first human one human and whatever that is how we unpack it but something came to me and was beautiful is when you was talking we do we miss the under part of the embassy because it says that yahweh god was walking with them in the cool of the day so if God was walking with them and they was but naked, God didn't have an issue with it and they didn't have an issue with it. But we have now made an issue out of it. And that's what I thought it was beautiful. And I said, whoa, that's deep because he walked in the cool of the day with them. And that means they was, as my grandmama said, just flesh but naked and didn't have no issue but now we have done and i like what you said um elder teller is the unpacking of really what sex is and we don't because i was raised that it was dirty it was filthy you didn't do it you didn't touch it unless you was there trying to make children and you know and i i think the biggest mistake i made one time when i was feeling good and grown is you know my grandmother was getting on me about being queer and she was saying you need children and i think the most maddest i ever seen her is and i asked her why don't my aunt and my uncle don't have any children but they're married and she went slap off she couldn't explain to me because i know they were they was um with teddy pendergraph turn off the lights and doing everything else but she could not explain to me because she was mad. She just put me out the house. She just go and everything else. So what I want to kind of wrap up, you know, we started late tonight, but I want to wrap up with this is how do we unpack? Or let, let me let me back up and say not unpack. How do we help one know that they don't have to separate sexuality from spirituality? and know that it's a packet you know I, I just went to walmart and bought two deodorants and they was packed together and i that's what i told somebody the other day that's the way i see spirituality and sexuality you know i don't unpack it you know what i'm saying so how do we help those understand you don't have to unpack it because what we have been taught is to unpack it it's, it's separated so how would you connect it and keep them down as one. Here's some of Listen, no, this is you know, this is an easy thing for the Lord because the truth is, I think that people love the patriarchy of church, right? We love the fat pastor and the first lady and their children. We love the representation almost as kingdom, right? It's a, this is our palace. This is my pastor, my first lady, we don't want to see them as a couple. So I just watched the other night, a beautiful conversation about relationships with Bishop T.D. and First Lady Jenks. And they got wrong, right? They were real. And she was talking about the reason that so many marriages these days have, uh, have fallen apart is that people don't want to talk about the for better or worse, for 
sick, you know, sickness and in health for richer or for poor, forsaking all others and everything is so easy now. And then she went on to say, that is why these young people now, she said, you want to know why young people these days want to write their own vows? They're easier to break. Because you don't have to hold commit to them. You get to say, that time I saw you walking down the street, I knew you the one. She said, you've made no commitment to anything. You just acknowledge some memories. And the truth is, and then she said, which I thought for her and it's, Mega church at this conference with 20,000 people. She said, That day I saw you walking down the street. I did not shut up, richer or poor, mm -hmm. sickness and health till death do you part, forsaking all of us. If you don't want to do that, don't get married. That was just kind of like, Oh my God, because you needed a married woman with 41 years under her belt to say, Do it or don't do it, but shut up with it. I made a vow because now half of what you're saying is not even a vow. And you have to hear that. So that you can take, okay, what I really wanted to say to you is this. What I really mean to say is I didn't know that this scripture could line up. You know, Reverend, you know, Reverend Jermaine, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm as likely to quote Natalie Cole and Nita Baker and, and, and Luke Savandroff as I am Luke, you know, Ruth and Esther. Because at the end of the day, what I love is the idea that you can sometimes challenge your church to turn on the radio and see what God is trying to say to you. Right? Turn it and then to be shook by, oh my God, oh my God. You know what I mean? Literally, I've had people come back to church the next Sunday. They might not have remembered the scripture. They said, you know, what is God, you know, preaching, God is trying to tell you something from the color purple, right? But speaking on it through scripture and then leaving them with the be listening for God this week and hearing somebody scream from the outside the church and then turn up the radio because ludicrous move, get out the way comes on and they're like, I've been struggling with these people at my job and God just told me to stop trying to fight them. Just move, get out the way. You get out the way. You keep trying to fight them. And God said, you get out the way. Stop making yourself such a willing victim, such a willing target, such a willing, because you thought you had to fight them to prove something. Shut up and watch me do it. The next week they came back to talk about how, how great work had been. Two weeks later, they had been promoted. And I didn't do nothing. I was like, just be on the listen for God. Be on the lookout. Where is God? And so it's the, the, the intimacy, and I'm so glad you brought that up, um, the Reverend Jermaine, that to go that go all the way back to that Adam and Eve, naked I stand before you. What is God trying to say to you that would make you not just giggle, but giggle, like giggle with glee, like, oh, Lord, stop. Like, all right, baby, today I need you to go out there and give it to him. Oh, I'm just going to put on a white shirt and these black pants. No, nope. you know you got to meet the day. I need you to get dressed like you can really give it to that's it. I'm gonna put the blue suit on, put the blue suit on, and the picture, and the picture, and the blue and pink tie, and the cut. Where you going to this meeting? Ooh, look, we thought you were gonna be the quiet one in the meeting. Now you gonna come in here and get. And I was like, I'm just waiting for you to show up. You know, Pastor, and Pastor, you got them locked. Somebody that and said something about your lock. We all locked up, and you know, the other mother said, oh, "Don't you want to just kind of? Don't you just want to be neatly presented?" Because that's out, that's foreign to them. And then you put on the suit and bring it in such a way with the necklace and right. like, oh, baby, you look nice. Just because they hadn't seen it before. We're called to give our parents and our grandparents something they hadn't seen before. And sometimes you get to set it to music and then make them go. And the scripture says, My God. Because once we do that, especially from our culture, that's why I'm going to shut up after this, we, 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 we can have moments where we realized we weren't wrong when we heard God in secular song. Because I remember watching uh, 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 Unsung on Switch, the R&B group. And one of the guys was uh, talking about the lyrical content of the I Call Your Name, uh, and it needs a pain, take away the, the stain. Hello, somebody. And he was saying that people were saying that the lead singer was singing that about Latoya Jackson because at the time he was dating her, even though he was gay, right? He was dating her because he was trying to find himself in those 70s, right? But he said, I find it particularly funny that people said that when I wrote the song and I was talking about the Lord. Wow. So people that made babies that I call your name, call in the name. And they got shame because they were like, oh, I felt religious. I felt very vulnerable, naked, and religious on that song. And it's an R&B song. God don't listen to the radio. <laughs> God created the radio and every song on it. And so to hear, I call your name, because quite frankly, that group full of those men of various sexual identities and expression that do hits. I call your name, and there'll never be a better love. Tell me. Those ain't both gospel. Okay. 
That's how we do it. We stop running away from it and show culturally how we find it every day in everything, right? In everything, give thanks. It is the will of God to be thankful in all we do. That's how we get there. Go. So I think uh, let's pr first have the, the uncomfortable conversation in defining intimacy. Because we know how to say, oh, he, he made love to my mind. Oh, he, he, she just knew what I, uh, you found a degree of intimacy that did not require there to be shaking of tables. Uh, you, you found a connection that made the love and the, the wake me up, show me what you got. You, you, that made that one minute seem like an hour mm -hmm. because you found a way to connect. And then let's have a little conversation about the songs and stuff. Let's go to biblical erotica. And that wasn't a duty bound process. That was, I'm courting to get to. And I notice the nectar <laughs> that flows through the peaks. Hey, only one thing that peaks on woman, and that's cool, but let's go into that. Let's have that conversation. Let's have the uncomfortableness of doing a Bible study centered on that. Mm -hmm. And then I guarantee you that just like the song that says, my love will come down, you will have a new form of intimacy with the divine yourself and somebody else and whoever else is that you're connected with. And there'll be healings and as they say, signs and wonders because something will happen to you that changes your perspective. Your countenance will change because now you know intimacy truthfully that it was a gift from God. You'll then know that sex was not this duty bound process, but it was our process to salvation because back in those days, it was the premise that sex, we were doing a duty to find Christ and Christ would come from it because an ancestor of Christ would come and then it will keep the bloodline going. But I want to just invite you into the process when David sat there and was a peeping Tom. But he was still a man after God's own heart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> David sat there and 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 did some triflingness and stole his boy's girl. We wonder why that happens now in the world, but we want to vilify the process. But it's biblically based. You know, the church folks say it's in the book. It's it, that's in the book. Baby daddy just it's in the book. Mm -hmm. Baby mamas and Maury Povich, it was in the book. So mm -hmm. now let's really have a conversation. How do we get there to merge it? Let's have a real conversation about intimacy. Like the, the prophet said, yours, every one of your needs, every one of the things that make you make your heart flutter, the thing that makes you feel vulnerable, the thing that makes a tear come from your eye, mine, everything that makes a tear fall from my eye, everything that makes me feel safe and vulnerable and sexy and mm, ours. Now we've come together to create a new understanding of what happens when that two magics, those two energies, that two spirits, those two holiness experiences come together. And then it says we can do it for hours. Champagne. It, 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 it allows us to understand. There's a nectar that comes from it. And then there's a food source that comes. That's the, that's the, that's the prophet. When the song came out and people were getting all in, they, they found their own new version of a new version of Teddy Pendergrass. But it was the moment that it was teaching us about intimacy. It's always that God is always bringing us back to intimacy. Into me, too. It's bringing us back to the space of loving ourselves, not because of the fact that my swag is pretty or my face is beat and I look like I defy age because that will pass. Not the fact that I had all these muscles and I'm fit and my cardio is on point or, or, or my bird size is immaculate or I don't have a gag reflex. No, 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 because that will come and that will pass. But it's the place where we find authentic power, where we're out able to come together in love. Like the song says, yours, mine, ours, I can do it for hours. Let's get to intimacy. And this references in the book, the Songs of Solomon. If, if it, That's not in the book, the Songs of Solomon, eight chapters. I dare you to take verse by verse and sit with God and let God tell you, what was the nectar? What was the foot? I dare you to go through that process. Because that ain't centered around incest, but that's a whole nother conversation for a whole nother day of the rest of the fight. But go to the songs of Solomon because they, they want to make it seem like intimacy and sex is dirty. It is not. It is not. It is not. It is in the book. You can't have, if God didn't expire humans to write it, there would have been no anointing to it. It's in the book. 
that's not a it's mystery. Biblical. It's, it's biblical. It, it, it's truly biblical. Before you even get to the the, 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 the the actual altar, it was biblical before. That's right. It, and as it's basic instructions before leaving earth. So there is a book that teaches you how to really understand the connectivity of your mind. So all that was was a remixed version to the songs of Solomon to a set of people that needed to experience God anew. It's in the book. It, ain't, it can't be separated. If, if, if we are so whole, if we so Bible and these are the inherent folk that believe that the word is the word and you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't okay, fine, amen. So intimacy is in there, in the Old Testament, the Songs of Solomon. So is whatever is in there was basic instructions before leaving earth. That's what it says. So if the Songs of Solomon is in the book and not the cap, let's not talk about the Catholic book. We're talking about the Protestant's book. The songs of Solomon is there, then boo boo, it's time for you to get some intimacy. Maybe that's why the relationship fell, because because you couldn't make you you didn't understand yours, minds, ours. We can do it for ours. You you didn't know how to make love to their mind beyond just their body, because you didn't even do that really well, because you learned it from another space that didn't show you the fullness of who you were. And you compared yourself to your bros based on their so-called stories. That was not validity. It was folklore. But the Bible, in the book, back is in the book. In the book. Crack it open, sugar. It's in the Old Testament. Go to the Songs of Solomon. I know that you don't be like to skip over it, but I dare you to take a, a, a journey through it. And let God speak to you. Follow through it. And that's why they tell us to strip down and become before the Lord. Because it's the uh, the essence of we connect back to the intimacy of God. So strip down to it. Get to the songs of Solomon. You'll find you'll find lo the Lord, <laughs> and it may improve your relationship. <laughs> it, it may make your 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 boo thing, your side piece, <laughs> a whole lot more in, engrossing the awesomeness that you are. Because why you got a new skill set? You learn intimacy. So that's it. Yeah. You know um, the singular context of intimacy is the observing our knowledge of a subject. And the question is how could we help our brothers and sisters and get to the place where they can talk about sex and spirituality. And for me, the conversation would be in order to learn something, you must first be attentive. You must first be patient. You must first be long suffering. You must first be um, uh, um, at peace, which are the elements of the fruit of the spirit. In order to know God, you have to take time to know you. Because before the foundation of the world was, uh, was formed, I created you. Before you were ever creating your mother's womb, I predestined you with purpose. Your, your, your genetic or our genetic makeup was specifically and uniquely designed by Christ. And if we don't take that time to learn of ourselves, to know ourselves, we should know what our favorite color is. We should know what our favorite meal is. We should know what ticks us off. We should see us getting an attitude before our attitude becomes manifestation and be able to intervene that. That's intimacy. It's the observance and the knowing. I need to observe myself and I need to take time to learn myself. What makes me do this? What makes me happy? And then when others come into my presence, I can teach them about who I am. The same way Christ says, come into the knowing of me. The more in the presence of him I am, the more I've learned of him. The more I realize he is farther beyond the box than others have always taught me he was. He can do exceedingly and abundantly above all I can act, say, or think. He can blow my mind. It's when we take the breaks off. And really, I'm glad we stuck with the word intimacy tonight because it is the observing and the knowledge, but we're not patient people. Humans 
Many humans struggle with patience. We struggle with being long suffering. We struggle with the elements. We struggle with self-control. But a part of intimacy is self-control. You got to know how much pressure to give. You got to know at which point you, you, you need to be where you need to be. Which point you need to be moving this way. God speaks in all things and he moves in all things. And the spiritual being who is well knowledgeable of themselves are attentive to those around them, whether it's a friend, whether it's an acquaintance, whether it's an environment, whether it's an atmosphere, I can smell trouble before trouble gets to me. It's because I've been around trouble long enough, I know what the wind looked like. Ah. The same I can look outside and say it's about the rain, a storm is coming. I know hell is headed my way. I can smell bull coming my way before it ever gets to me. That right there ain't nothing but a mess. Keep on moving. Why? Because I've come into the knowledge and I'm observing. I can see the signs. When we get to the depth of that, we not only can allow Christ to blow our mind, we blow the minds of those who come in our presence. And then miracles, signs, and wonders shall follow us all the days of our lives. And then I can dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Why? Because everywhere I am, I'm a temple, baby. Everywhere I am, I'm power. I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm a chain breaker. You can't come into my presence and not feel glorious and wonderful. You should feel like you went to the beauty shop when you come out of my presence. Because, baby, I know I'm a game changer. I know I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an atmosphere shifter. You can't shift me. You can't move me. Because I saw you before you ever came. And I heard the voice of the Lord tell me what I needed to say to you. This is a movement into spirituality. It's the breaking of a system into the system of Christ that is limitless. And so that's how I say we help each other, by challenging each other to get to know yourself. Where you want to eat? Oh, I don't know. How do you know? You know. And then when you say, all right, then let's go to McDonald's. No, I don't want no McDonald's. Let's go. I don't want no check. Yeah, people get on my nerves. They, Know yourself enough to speak who you are, what it is you want, what it is you need, because I'm telling you, I'm not a psychic. God didn't create me to guess about you. You need to be able to tell me about you. Now, what God wants me to reveal, he'll reveal, but there are some things we have to be put to reveal, and we have to take the works off of that. So there's so much unpacking in that. Amen. I tell you, this is so, this is so good. Because you know the thing is, uh, I understand one of the things, and then I'm going to give y'all a chance to close out tonight. You know, I love Romans 8 because we all get into the, the meat of it. You know, I'm more than a conqueror, but it's really talking about the intimacy of staying in the spirit. And see, mm -hmm. the thing that we need to teach people is it says, well, nothing shall separate me from the love of God. Nothing shall separate me from God. So when we go into that bedroom and close the door, God is still in that room with us. God is in the midst of that. And when we could put God in the midst of that and stop leaving God outside the bedroom door and bring God in, then that's when we will learn true empathy. So that's my little word for right now. So I'm going to let y'all close out and let y'all go. And, and I'm, I'm going to go fan a little bit, amen, and everything else. But that's what I understand is it's time to bring God into every room that you go into. Every room that you walk with someone in, you should be able to go into it and let God come with you. All right. Anyway, any closing remarks tonight before I let your beautiful, wonderful people close out? <laughs> this, is, this is what I'll close with. And I'm, I'm grateful to have this conversation. I know it's uncomfortable for a lot of people, but this is why yes. we need to have the conversation. But this is what I'll close and say. Before you go work out, there is a stretching that happens. There's a preparation that happens. Before you go give a word, there's a preparation that happens. In everything we do, there is a process that you as an individual go through to connect you to what it is you need to do. When I get up to go to work in the morning, there's, there, there's a song I need to hear, there's a certain tempo I need, and I'm looking for it. Until I get it, I ain't ready to go to work. I need to, I need to get this out. 
when we get to the place and embrace this place, embrace and do not shortchange your process of getting where you need to be to do what it is that God has anointed you to do. And don't be afraid to be different. If you are in the presence of people who seem not to embrace your gifts, your talents, then move on. The Bible said, dust your feet and move on. Stop giving your confidence away because they didn't receive you, baby. You're just not where I am right now. And that's cool because there is somewhere else that God is calling me to be that will receive me. And the Bible said, yeah, I stand the door knocking and make him my voice. I come in and sit with you. And not only did he say, I sit with you, he said, I will suck with you, which means I will take my time with you. And so we, I encourage us to learn how to take time with time. Just take time with time in everything we do. Take time with time. And that's all I have to say. Mm. Come on, let's draw some diamonds and some jewels and some- For some stuff. reason, this conversation about Adam and Eve took me all the way back to the beginning and why we were given partnership in the first place, right? And the whole idea that we keep living life looking for other people's approval. And what God said to us was, so here's the being you are. Here is someone that I have created for you. You struggle with this. I'm sending you a helpmate, right? And this thing, when you get to it, it will be so strong that for this reason, shall you cleave to one another and leave your family behind. God, in that moment where you have that euphoria, like when you choose well, not choose loneliness, not choose somebody just because you don't like your own company, but choose because, like you said before, there's something in the, the sepiosexuality, something in the, demio, the demisexuality spark. And then you got together, and then you felt like, oh my God, you've heard people say, I knew in weeks, I knew when I first saw them, you know, when it clicks and sticks. And then you guys are now, for this reason, cleave to this and leave anybody else behind that need be left behind. And being able to walk in the world in ways that, 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 that remind, remind is your mind, but to have the mind in you that is in Christ Jesus. And when you get lost to be reminded, like you were in the club and something about Patrice Russian, you know, had young, you going, I've been looking for you. Haven't you heard? And you thought, this sounds like God, but I, you know, I don't know the Bible well enough. It couldn't be that. And then you become a young person who's now a young minister and Kirk Franklin got looking for you and it's got the same track up under it. And you're like, God, that really was you all those years ago. I've been looking for you. Haven't you heard? I told you in the club. I told you in the street. I told you on WBLF. I told you when you went down to DC, the WHUR, I've been looking for you. And I knew I would find you in music. You were listening. You had ears and you weren't prepared to hear. There you go. Now we see the season of hearing. You know, I just saw, literally just shared a, um, uh, a little meme before we went live. that said, listen and silent, all can, you know, both contain the same letters. Like we want to be silent before God, but we got to listen for God at the same time. Shut up and listen. Shut up and listen. Because God says, I've been looking for you. I've been trying to talk to you. And you think you couldn't, you think it couldn't have been me because of something somebody said but you prayed to me about when it was time to move on your business and you walked in the club and it's time for the percolator came on. You thought that you weren't enough for me and that somehow this movement into your faith wasn't a thing that you could be adorned with because you hadn't gone to school, because you hadn't been faithful long enough, because you don't know all the books of the Bible. But this will be an everlasting love for me is a singer, is a sinner's confession. I'm so glad you found me in time. I'm so glad you rectified my mind. This will be an everlasting love for me. Loving you is some kind of wonderful because you've shown me just how much you can. You've given me the thrill of a lifetime and made me believe you've got more thrills to spare. That ain't nobody on God's earth. That's God. And when we can wrap ourselves in that, we trust our choices because most of us don't trust our choices because we don't trust the chooser. And when we can get clear and cleanse about who we are and the intention of God for us, I, I, 
I know the plans I have for you, they are plans to prosper you with a great life in the future. If we believe that about God, great and marvelous things you know not of, if we believe that about God, we go looking for God instead of proof that mama was right. Instead of, is the preacher right about me? Is God about me right about me? All I'm concerned about is God right about me. That voice that whispers, go. That voice that says, Kevin, put the, put, the, put the yellow suit on. Put it on. God, really? Put the yellow suit on. And dare to be you. Because, you know, what God gave me, you know, and Jermaine has heard it, I desire what I deserve. Like, I, it is in my heart. I desire what I deserve, and I deserve what I desire. God wouldn't bring me to it if God wasn't going to bring me through it. And to walk in that mantra includes me surrendering to the desire and the reverence that I am making space for it first. I desire what I deserve, and I deserve what I desire. I desire what I deserve, and I deserve what I desire, and make room for it. When I first heard that, y'all, I saw Eveline dying in the whiz, and the old suits peeling off and can you feel a brand new day? I desire, I don't desire your judgment. I don't desire your commentary. I desire what I deserve. Yes, when, I, when I got that and it walked up my spine like grace and mercy, I don't, that's not a thing a person on earth could ever say to me that could separate me from what God has already said to me. Mm. Nobody, as Keith Sweat said, nobody, 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 nobody. Bring you want to end with something tonight in Jesus' name? Uh, uh, oh. <laughs> so I want to talk to the folks who have been in church or who may not, who felt the church kind of told them some stuff. And I want to invite you to sing the 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 an intimacy song, an intimacy song that the church has. And it just says, yes, Lord. From the bottom of my heart mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the depth of my soul, yes, Lord. Completely yes. My soul says yes. A lot of folks say this is a song to Jesus and Jesus, and that's great. It is the blueprint to our ability to find intimacy first with us. Can you say yes to yourself that you deserve it? And that you can say from the bottom of your heart, all to the bottom of, to the depths of every vow that pumps life into you, that you can say yes to the life that you have. And get all acquainted with the awesomeness. And then after you get acquainted with your emotional state and you have now risen your consciousness, it then says to the depths of my soul, yes, Lord. Okay. Then can you find your spiritual understanding and connectivity to the process deep down in your so, yes, your Lord. And then it says on the other part, because the pieces, you done did the emotional maturity and you worked through that from the depths of your heart and then you went to your soul and you now are spiritually transformed. It then says you are complete. There was nothing lacking into you. And now that you are complete, you can come into the process that the church folks have told you all the time. When there are two or more gathered, God is then in the midst. So whatever yes. you have taken this new level of intimacy, when you sung this song, when you feel that somehow you're a sinner and somehow you are going to hell, I did it then up to the point that you go into intimacy with God, that yes, Lord. And then once you do that, when there are two or more gathered, God then now shows up in the midst. So now true worship happens. So when the doors close and you said, yes, Lord, completely, two complete persons that went to the bottom of their heart, to the depths of their soul. And now it's two of you or more. It, the, the church folks say it when they're two or more gathered. So now you are gathered in the, the upper room. Worship can now begin because you found intimacy with yourself and the other folks, you've inspired them to sing the song with you. That's why folks can call out, oh God, in the midst of the, of, of the experience. Why? Because, yes, Lord, <laughs> from the bottom of my heart to the depths of my soul. Yes, Lord, completely yes. My soul says yes. And then, you know, church folks, they have run that in part. My soul says yes, yeah, and it gives emphasis. It stretches out yes. For you to fill the fullness, the breath of the experience of your intimacy. That is totally you, and then you get to share it. Nothing God has given us is for us to hoard, but it's for us to be healed by it and then share it. It's a new anointing for 2023. It's called intimacy.
Because when there are two or more gathered, God is in the midst. Call your anointing down. Yes, Lord, from the bottom of my heart. Call your anointing down to the depth of my soul. Call this new anointing that would literally heal you and all the folks that are two or more gathered in your room. I dare you to call on the yes, Lord. And then stretch it out. When you feel that you are getting stuck in it, the end of the song says it, and my soul says yes, it stretches it because it has to allow you to know that you are greater, that you have the elasticity to expand and include. Worship, the intimacy is in the song. <laughs> the intimacy of the process to love thou God with thy, all thy heart and all thy selves. And the second is likened to the first, to love thy neighbor as thyself. It's a form of intimacy. The Bible is telling us it's a call to intimacy, not something duty bound, but something spirit bound. I invite you into the process of singing the new worship song of intimacy. So now when you're in church and you're having that moment and they start to sing it, you, you have a new meaning because it's now calling you to go deeper in to your heart. Let's get them emotions together. Let, let, let's heal those spaces within us. And, and then to the depths of my soul, that means you go so far beyond what you've been comfortable with. So let's stop putting our foot in the water of your, our hearts and our souls. It's just to the bottom of it. That's like the Navy SEALs training at the bottom of a pool. You got to go down to the bottom of it. And you get new strength. You get new endurance. Because we, we've engaged in this new form of intimacy that the church folk try to make it seem like they wasn't saying it all the time. When there are two or more gathered, God has been in the midst. That means there is no separation. For mm -hmm. whomever is in the, in the bedroom, in the kitchen, on the patio, in the car, when there are two or more gathered. That's so that's right. not just for the, the experience of intimacy, of physical love, but that's intimacy even with our friendships and every ship we are engaging from the bottom of my heart. Yes, Lord. To the depths of my soul. Yes, Lord. I am completely yes, Lord. It reminds it, it, completely yes. My soul says it it, it, it constantly brings us back to the reminder. So when there are two or more gathered, so when you're with your friends, bring this new form of this a new anointing to your friendships. Okay. Bring this new anointing to your family. Bring this new anointing to your co-workers. Bring this new anointing to the stranger on the street. And I dare you, I, I dare you, and I know it'll change your life. Why? Because yes, Lord. They said yes, yes is a complete sentence. Yeah, it's it's, it's a complete sentence. It's, it's a, find that intimacy. Whenever you feel that you go to that, oh, come to the new prophet. Yours, mine, ours. I can do it. Let the song of it's the hymnal, the feel song of intimacy resonate in you anew. So you get freed from the shackles that you're no longer bondage. Because yes, Lord. Yes, completely yes. Yeah. I, I'm an image actor. I'm trying to keep myself Gather right now, y'all to mess me up tonight. Yes, Lord. Two or more gathered. Well, tonight I am so grateful for the patience of my panelists. I am grateful because you know the thing is, I have to say this is um our theme here at Unity Fellowship of South Carolina that God gave me in January is evolving our consciousness. And this is the reason that we are having these discussions is to evolve our consciousness and do a new thing. So I'm excited for, and this word is a prophetic word into me tonight. For some reason, this word has popped up together. So I praise God for each one of you. Thank you so much tonight. Um, thank you for this part two coming back in and everything else. And Unity, appreciate every one of you, your volunteer. Elder tell I love you to death, honey. You teaching me some new things. And you and, and tonight I got spanking by you and you didn't even know you spanked me. But I thank you. I thank you, Apostle Montgomery, for challenging my, my, my psyche and green. You take places, me some places, some way. You leave me on the side of the road but I find my way back. So I appreciate and love you all 
and we will be having more discussions coming very soon. So what we will say tonight is our affirmation is evolving from loving to acceptance. And this is what all this conversation is. So good night. And everyone just say thank the panelists and be blessed and have a rest of a good evening. Y'all take care now. Thank y'all so much. Bless you. Bless you, brother. Bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. Bless you, bless you. Good night, Kings. Y'all be blessed, be well. All right. Good night.